Hey, welcome to Modern Day Hysteria. Very excited to have you here for this brand new debate. We have two speakers that are going to do phenomenally well tonight as they are working very hard on presenting their case as clearly as possible. So with this, I'm going to get into it quite quickly. We have a formal debate. And with this, I'm just going to turn down the volume here. I think I might hear an echo. <clears throat> Perfect. So, thanks very much. We are debating the biblical model versus the evolutionary model. And with that, our two debaters have their channels in the description below, so you can check out their channels. And that way, even if you don't agree with them, you can at least understand where they're coming from, and you can check out their sources. So, if they have any links that they are referring to throughout the debate, you can see them down there. And we can, of course, put them in after if they come up with any new ones. So. Let's get started. First, we are going to go over to Standing for Truth, who is going to be the person who starts the debate. And for this first per first portion, we are just going to ask if you could just share for maybe 30 seconds about what you're doing at your channel. Standing for Truth, please go ahead. Hey, brother. Well, thanks for having me on tonight. I'm, I'm very excited. I think this is going to be fun. Um, thanks for participating as well, RJ. Uh, my channel, just the usual, doing discussions, making clips, trying to uh, you know promote uh, the truth. Um, I'm, I suspect there's going to be more to come. Uh, maybe even more discussions, hopefully here on Modern Day Hysteria's channel. Uh, he's doing a great job. I appreciate being here, and um, let's have some fun. Awesome. Thanks so much, and thanks for being here. And RJ, very excited to have you here. If you want to share about what you're doing at your channel. Yeah, oh, I do the Evolution Hours every Wednesday. I put a little link up. Uh, hopefully you can add into the thing on, on my main website because I have a link to my books and uh, all the different material. That's kind of like the clearinghouse for thing. It's still a, a work in progress. Um, I am a, a, a critic of uh, creationism and of bad methods generally, and that's uh, what I am going at from a source methods level which is looking at how people construct arguments, what material they pay attention to, and more importantly, what they don't. You bet. Well, we're glad to have you both here. And as I mentioned, thanks for being here, audience. And thanks for your patience as well. Sorry about the time mix up. It was actually my fault, completely my fault. I gave the debaters two different times. Uh, so please bear with me. I'm learning, I'm growing, and uh, and we're going to make it together. So Easter thanks for your time patience. is not standard time. <laughs> it is not. They are two are different times. You are forgiven. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So with that, we're going to jump right into it. So for the format, we're actually going to have 12-minute opening statements. And so each one will go, and as mentioned, Standing for Truth will actually start. And then we will have three five-minute rebuttals from each side. So a lot of back and forth then a closing statement of five minutes, and then whatever we have left over is going to be for Q&A. So very excited to hear your questions. You can shoot them into the comments with an at Modern Day Hysteria. That'll show me that you're asking the question for one of the debaters. If you can identify which debater, that helps me even more. So with that, let's get the ball rolling. Standing for truth, I am setting the timer, and the floor is yours. Thanks, brother. Well, I'll get right into it. The debate is biblical model versus an evolutionary model. Um, I think when it comes down to design, you know, that's pretty easy to prove and to demonstrate. Um, really, I don't feel like there should be any debate regarding the clear and obvious design of this universe and all its complexity. Um, say you're walking through the woods, find an arrowhead. I think it's pretty obvious and evident and intuitive to pick it up. And although it's really nothing more than rock, it's nothing... It, it's it's just normal natural material it, it has been shaped and designed for a purpose and so the only logical conclusion from everybody i would say is that somebody made this and it did not it could not happen from abrasion or any other natural process since this rock was handled and shaped through design this was obviously designed by by someone or something um, and you can kind of compare that to a diatom. If anyone's familiar with that, to say that that came about through natural processes, I think would be absolutely uh, delusional and silly. Uh, what we know about empirical science, it points us to a time consisting of the creation of matter and energy, as well as a time of creation or a moment of least entropy. The first law points us to the necessity of a creator outside of creation. And the second law itself points us directly to creation itself. 
In the Bible, a moment of least entropy is fully described in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Applied to the whole universe, this is a fundamental contradiction to the chaos, to cosmos, all by itself, doctrine of atheism and an evolution. Now, the question is, though, who is this designer and what model best explains the empirical data? What is the origin of species? Let me demonstrate to the audience that fatal blow to pond scum to people evolution, as well as the overwhelmingly strong evidence for a biblical based model that I believe cannot be refuted. Now, the question of the origin of species concerns the origin of traits, not bones found in the dirt. Now, here are just a few reasons why no bone in the dirt can really be used as empirical evidence for universal common ancestry, since all observable evidence in the present and in genetics tells us that this theory is absolutely impossible. A few things that come to mind that have been overturned. We know evolutionists have always said that the human to chimpanzee genetic identity is about 98 to 99%. What we now know, based on many factors, many calculations, the actual genetic identity is only 88%. To put that into perspective, that's 400 million DNA differences that exist between the two species. Another one they like to use is human chromosome number two, which they say arose through a fusion of two ape-like chromosomes. Now, this purported fusion site is actually a functional DNA element in a human gene. Another one that we know has been overturned is the gene order that they claim is along chromosomes has no function. Therefore, shared gene order demonstrates common ancestry. But what we now know is that gene order along chromosomes does indeed perform a function. They'll say humans and chimpanzees share genetic mistakes or what RJ may be familiar with as pseudogenes. Pseudogenes we now know appear to be functional DNA elements, not mistakes. One example they would say is, I know Dr. Venema from BioLogos likes to use uh, the one that says humans possess the broken remnants of an ancient chicken gene. We now know that no such remnant exists. Instead, the fragment appears to be a functional DNA element. But most importantly in our model, I'm gonna get to the entropic degeneration of our genome. And to make it simple here, um, actually, we would know that most of the people in the field of population genetics are aware that there is a growing genetic load due to accumulation of deleterious mutations, really regardless of what the science deniers say. Now, what can selection plus mutation do and what can it do? Well, for one, based on the entropic degeneration of our genome, it can't build the genome. It comes down to a net loss versus a net gain. And this does not bode well for evolution. There are a number of problems with evolutionary theory. Human genetic degeneration is a real and serious concern. Now, human mutation is catastrophic. It is arguably one of the primary causes for death and suffering. We know that all non-neutral mutations are deleterious and we inherit a multitude of mutations from our parents and our grandparents. And then from the very first division of our zygote, we begin to add new mutations to that genetic load. We accumulate mutations at the rate of approximately three new mutations every cell division throughout our lifetime. So that growing genetic load is what causes aging and limits the upper life limit of our race. And so we die due to primarily mutation accumulation. But the tragic thing is that is not the end of it because we pass on the mutations that we inherited and that we have generated to our children. And so our children should be more mutant than their parents consistently, which is why genetic load tends to accumulate continuously over time. To put this into perspective, human mutation rate is 100 mutations per person per generation. And so it is a fact that our children have about 100 more mutations than we have. And our grandchildren will have 100 more mutations than they have. I think that's evident based on the evidence. It is more disturbing though on a population level. And that's where the concern lies. If there are 100 mutations per person and there are 7 billion people on the planet, then there is 700 billion new mutations entering the human population this generation. And so the question becomes, what type of selection could eliminate so many mutations that are pouring into the human population? Now, I think it's obvious that selection must somehow 
somehow prevent the accumulation of large numbers of minor mutations or the species will rapidly deteriorate and fitness will decline. However, even if selection could keep minor mutations in check, it appears to be powerless to stop the accumulation of the most abundant class, which if you're following is the nearly neutral mutations. Therefore, higher genomes must eventually all degenerate in the long run with or without selection. This means that the theory of Ponscombe to people evolution really has no theory to stand on. Now, mutations at near neutral nucleotide positions are deleterious and subject to random drift making them immune to selection. These nucleotide sites contain meaningful information and their mutation contributes to the erosion of information collectively. And that's what we're looking at is these near neutral nucleotides account for most of the information in the genome. This is just as true as the fact that all the seemingly insignificant letters in a book collectively add up to a clear message. But if we start, say, with a very long and complex written message, say, an encyclopedia, and we start to introduce typographical error, most of the individual errors will only have an extremely trivial effect on the total message. Individually, I think anybody can see that they're truly insignificant. But if this process is not halted, the message will eventually become corrupted and will eventually be completely lost. Another thing that you can compare it to as well is rust on a car. And even though every atom, which is happening at a time, say, in comparison to the near neutral mutations, each iron atom that oxidizes seems perfectly insignificant, but added up across the entire car, the process is certain and deadly. No selection scheme can stop this process. This whole problem has led one prominent population geneticist to write a paper entitled, and I'm sure RJ is, is more than aware of this, why have we not died 100 times over? The problem of the unselectability of near neutrals is very real. Now, there are some rebuttals out there. Hopefully, RJ can, can bring some up, but they're very weak. And the fact of genomic degeneration makes evolution impossible, which makes their arguments from, say, the fossil record a circular argument. Now, one that I've seen is them saying that, oh, most mutations are not harmful, but neutral, but this response misunderstands the entire point at hand. Sure, most mutations are neutral from the perspective of the organism's physical fitness, but all mutations must have effect on the genetic content, or in other words, the genotype. In no way are mutations truly neutral. They all must have effect on the genotype, even if they only affect the efficiency of transfer RNA production. So I think it's pretty obvious that most are harmful. Now, obviously we can see that Ponscombe to people evolution is impossible, but let's look at the biblical model. Let's look at the created heterozygosity hypotheses. Now, I won't have too much time based on the, the limits here to get into it too extensively, but if the ancestors to modern species possess millions of heterozygous nuclear DNA sites, new species arise naturally. Say through the processes of recombination and gene conversion, new nuclear chromosome combinations arise each generation. Now, when these processes involve millions of heterozygous sites, changes in visible traits are almost guaranteed to appear each generation. Why would God make clones? So this heterozygous hypothesis is certainly plausible given a biblical model. Now, to produce a new species, these traits and nuclear DNA combinations must be isolated. I don't think anyone's arguing with that. Now, small population sizes, inbreeding, and migration can lead to the founding of new, more homozygous populations. As these more homozygous groups grow to larger and larger sizes, they might eventually be recognized as new species. Now, Hopefully we get more into that, but if we look at nested hierarchies, nested hierarchies in DNA is also predicted by creationists based on the design model. The classification of life can be compared to classification of cars on how different companies manufacture cars left. based on their similarities forming hierarchies. For example, humans, pigs, rats, ducks are all land dwelling. Even though they are separate kinds since they're all land dwelling, they can share similar nested hierarchies or designs. Same is true with different bird kinds. All flying birds will share similar nested hierarchy or designs as well. So evolutionists can't really use nested hierarchies as evidence for evolution since there's a competing explanation. Now, phylogenetic systematics, which many would say is, is their best, for example, is, is mostly based on the concept of the outdated junk DNA, 
we know that has been overturned. Since DNA functions are only beginning to be found during the last decade, meaning we understand less than 5% of the DNA language, and the trajectory strongly suggests the vast majority of DNA will be functional, this takes away the primary assumption of evolutionary phylogenetics, which is based on mutations and pseudogenes. If the vast majority of DNA is functional, it becomes a common design argument as creationists have always predicted the vast majority of DNA is functional. Now, the ENCODE project also shows left. that most nucleotides play a role in multiple overlapping codes, making any beneficial mutations which are not deleterious at some level vanishingly rare. This only helps the case for one, the entropic degeneration of our genome and for the biblical model. Now, I have more to say, especially in regards to the right. LMN haplogroups and how they point us right back to Noah's three daughter-in-laws, confirming yeah. even more abundantly time. how well the biblical-based model meets and fits empirical data. Time. But for the sake of time, I'll save that later. Thanks, brother. Bet. All right, very excited. We got our first opening statement in. So we are now going to kick it over to RJ. The clock is set. So RJ, the floor is yours. Okay. Gosh, this was fun. Um, uh, it was a long primer on stuff that uh, he's channeled from uh, John Sanford and Jeffrey Tompkins and uh, Nathaniel Jensen and others. Uh, but the issue is one that relates to whether or not what he just said was actually true or not. And what I had originally wanted this discussion to be about would be source methods. And uh, if I had a source methods as bad as uh, a standing does or the creationist he's relying on, I wouldn't want to have that analyzed either. Um, the, the issue is to what extent uh, he's relying on secondary sources that he doesn't fact check, the claims that he offers about, uh, oh, the ENCODE project or uh, uh, genetic entropy and uh, pseudogenes, he's just wrong on. And if you actually look at the primary source material, you're going to discover that Sanford has misrepresented his source base. He's gotten his mathematics wrong. He's extrapolated material, which is why nobody outside of the narrow creationist world pays the slightest attention to any of these people because they don't have the creds to deal with it. They often have to publish in very obscure journals and paper journals. It's They're becoming more and more marginalized. But I also was curious about um, what wasn't discussed in the biblical worldview, uh, the implication that there is the biblical worldview. I understand Standing uh, is a young earth creationist, that he is a, a, a Kent Hovian style young earth creationist. John Sanford is a young earth creationist. The problem is, is that the biblical worldview has undergone a long evolution over time. There isn't a worldview, there is multiple ones. Originally, it was flat earth geocentric. They allowed for slavery, they all sorts of things. It was a unitary God. It didn't involve a Trinitarian, Jesus Christ, all of that. All of that came about over time as the culture changed, information was worked in. They gave up on flat earth uh, by the early second, uh, third, fourth century uh, period. You have found a few uh, diehards who were still going at it uh, in the fourth century, but they had pretty much been okay with uh, the Greek science of the time, which was still geocentric. And they stuck with that for the next thousand years. Uh, apparently nobody had thought that the earth actually revolves around the sun for obvious reasons, because the earth doesn't seem to be moving. But it took the new scientific revolution with Galileo and Kepler, who gave up on circular orbits because he knew about beer barrels and that they had elliptical beer barrels and he knew about the uh, mathematics of ellipses. So he was able to look at new worlds. Uh, and uh, gradually they had to give up on the geocentrism angle as well. Although there are still flat earthers today, largely fundamentalist Christians who are just as convinced that their version of the biblical reality is the true one. There are geocentrists who are creationists who are also in favor of that. Answers in Genesis and ICR write hilarious contradictory things complaining about the geocentrists and the flat earthers, but they're just as convinced they're right. And indeed, geocentrists play a role. Elwanger, who wrote the uh, creation science legislation in the 1980s, it was a, uh, a Roman Catholic geocentrist. Uh, Gerardus Boo is still active. Uh, Malcolm Bowden over in Britain, who uh, inspired Philip Johnson to doubt human evolution, uh, that he's a geocentrist. Uh, and uh, you've got uh, Tom Willis, who actually wrote the 1999 Kansas uh, education standards, um, isn't at all convinced that the earth revolves around the sun. So geocentrism is still alive and well, and they are just as convinced they have the true biblical worldview. Uh, the creationism that you find at Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research is a really recent phenomenon. It came from the 20th century 
when um, uh, uh, Ellen White at the Seventh-day Adventists uh, had Jesus come to her and show her an angel, showed her um, the flood, and she decided that that was all real. And so uh, that got filtered through into uh, Henry Morris, uh, uh, William Tinkle, who was a eugenics creationist, uh, 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 Rusis Rushduni, who's a, a highly politically conservative one, uh, who actually founded modern uh, young earth creationism. And it got going in the 60s and 70s, but it was not the same content as what we find today. I noticed he focused entirely on genetics. This is all a recent phenomenon. This was not a concern of young earth creationism up until fairly recently, when you find new breed of ones who are trying to find evidence for Adam and Eve, they're trying to find evidence for fixed kinds, they're trying to find evidence of this alleged genetic deterioration, that when you actually look at the data, uh, modern genetics doesn't support that at all. And that's why you don't uh, find this outside of the material at the Answers Research Journal. Um, and uh, creationism has evolved as well. Um, modern creationism of the 21st century stripes is kind of okay with plate tectonics. They didn't start out that way. They were absolutely certain that continental drift was complete crock. And they eventually had to adopt it in the same way that you hear stuff about pseudogenes and all of this as if they were paying attention to this. No, 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 no. There's an awful lot of, of moving the goalposts going on in creationism. And I don't expect that to ever change. Um, the, the clash of, of worldviews is also a very typical one in creationist apologetics. And it's wanting to make it that you've got the atheist worldview of evolution versus the biblical worldview that's only this little narrow frame. Uh, the problem is the data is still there. Uh, I know that the sources that Standing relies on insist that pseudogenes don't exist, but they do. Uh, that junk DNA was never regarded as something that said that it couldn't possibly have any meaning, but the vast majority of it doesn't do anything. 10% of our human genome are just ALU retrotransposons. Now, I have constantly been asking people in the creationism defense community, uh, do they claim that all of those were deliberately designed? Were they intended to be there? Uh, are any of them containing variant information? They do a variety of things. Most of them don't do a damn thing at all. Uh, they found um, a small smattering of them that have kicked on because there's a single point mutation that can turn a, a, a readme code on. And most of the time it produces diseases. So if you're gonna argue that these were in deliberately designed, then you're gonna have to run up to that. The same thing goes on with the, with the other uh, retrotransposons and, and endogenous retroviruses and all of that. There's a vast amount of technical literature that exists out there. And I guarantee you if Standing for Truth has only been reading the apologetics he gets from creationists, he will be missing most of that data field. And he will have no idea how far removed from the actual technical literature that they are. Um, uh, just in a discussion that we had post-show from the last uh, discussion with um, the Nephilim was involved, and it, I was very annoyed because Nephilim kept on repeating the same question over and over again. Uh, but uh, Standing for Truth brought up uh, some material from Nathaniel Jensen on uh, the finch beaks, uh, the finch, uh, finch uh, uh, hybridization. And uh, that was another example of where Jensen was misrepresenting the source material, where he was um, implying something about the genetics of finches in general that was unjustified, that was unjustified based on the enormous amount of work that the Grants and others have done in their various papers. And I would love to know whether uh, Standing for Truth ever bothered to read the original paper that Jensen cited, let alone all of the dozens of technical papers that they've done in various things over the last few years, most of them either under Rosemary Grant or, uh, or her husband Peter Grant as the lead authors in this, they generally put out about one paper a year on that because they've been studying these things in depth for longer than Standing for Truth has been alive. And it's a huge body of information, all of which needs to be accounted for. I do want to put in a point about the fossil record. Kent Hovind in particular, takes the idea that fossils don't matter, that it doesn't say anything, it's all circular arguments, and you've got this trope that you know, uh, I hear him putting up about the uh, pond scum to people. Uh, no, I'm afraid there's more to it than that. And we do know about the reptile mammal transition data field. And there you have predicted fossils, you have developmental biology, you have genetics, you now have starting to do retro engineering of things to where they've recreated 100 million years worth of mammal teeth. They've been working out the exact mechanisms of how this goes on. 
bringing up arguments about rust or uh, objects like arrowheads that do not replicate is twaddle. But the reason why um, anti-evolutionists have so much trouble uh, dealing with the natural world is because they start from an assumption at far back and try to move a little bit into the data field where the regular science starts from all the data that we can see in all the species that we can see in the developmental biology and the genetics and work backwards to see, well, this came from that and that developed from that gene mutation and there we can experiment with that. And this means we can retro engineer this particular protein and test it out and we find that it has the transitional features that we were expecting. And there's a huge amount of technical literature. It's 2018. And uh, I can see I've still got about a minute and a half to go here. Uh, and um, the fossil record is massive. And I do not have to guess that no anti-evolutionist, including everybody that standing for truth might have ever bothered to read, has ever accounted for the reptile mammal transition. Instead, they slide away from it. I want to know, why would a designer go out of their way to make probanognathans that are deliberately, precisely matching an exact and specific evolutionary prediction that has to be true in order for evolution to be true? So if God doesn't want me to believe in evolution, he shouldn't have created therapsids. That was just plain dumb. And the same goes for all the other fossil record with the early uh, proto-dinosaurs and the crocodilia formes and the mammalia formes. And it's just a vast field. It's no coincidence that anti-evolutionists, whether they're creationists or intelligent designers, have not contributed notably to the paleontological institution in the last hundred years. And that's because their model is just wrong. It leads to no understanding of anything. It leads to no following of anything. And even in the, uh, the genetic field, uh, Sanford is a minor player in this area and is becoming increasingly minor. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, also minor player. That if, if you look at the, the field, the people that work, they are following an evolutionary paradigm because it works, it's successful. It leads to new information. It leads to new discoveries. And the whole paleogenomic field is one of where the phenomenon of life on Earth is increasingly being retro-engineerable so we can literally recreate the evolutionary sequences involved. Well, I'm under my 12 minutes and I will pass on to the rebuttal. Thank you very much, RJ. Excellent opening statements, very clear. I appreciate it from you both. And now we are going to move into the rebuttal phase. So. Thanks for being here. As mentioned, if anybody has a question, feel free to put at Modern Data Area, let me know, and I'll try to sift it out from the comments and save it for the Q&A. So uh, we are now going to transition to Standing for Truth for his five minute rebuttal. And I am setting the clock and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, RJ. I think this is going to be fun. Um, I didn't see much of a, a model being presented. I've seen a lot of accusations of, of bias, um, but certainly there's a naturalism bias uh, when it comes to the evolutionary community. Uh, so at the end of the day, we do publish, uh, you know, peer reviewed work, peer reviewed journals, and it seems like uh, the evolutionary community is certainly turning um, a blind eye to it. I didn't see any rebuttal to that of entropic genomic degeneration, in other words, uh, genetic entropy. Uh, these deleterious mutations, they're accumulating. Um, obviously, the, the, the primary axiom cannot be true. Um, I want to see a, an observable and demonstrable mechanism that adds new, novel, and meaningful information to the genome, or else the theory really has nothing to stand on. Now, I noticed he talked about um, CPT, and um, if anyone doesn't know about that, that's catastrophic plate tectonics. That certainly makes testable, falsifiable predictions. Um, just one example of the evidence for that, I mean, if you look at the Indian plate uh, that pushes up to Eurasia, that pushed up the huge Tibetan plateau is, is really evidence of, of the CPT model that happened during the global flood. And at the end of the day, slow and gradual evolution could not accomplish that. It had to have been an awful strong force that created the this plateau with Mount Everest. So I don't know how the, the evolutionists would explain that, plus all the other evidence for CPT. When it comes to junk DNA, um, at the end of the day, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that we speak less than one one to three percent of the, of the DNA language, even just looking at the, the history of genetics. Back in the 40s, it was one gene, one protein, one function. Many things have been overturned. And we know uh, RNA used to be underappreciated 
Uh, junk DNA at the end of the day is, is decades ago uh, biology. RNA is now known to have many unexpected functions. We are dealing with a highly compressed DNA code beyond the best computer code. We write books. We don't write books that can be read forwards and backwards. DNA can. Look at something like protein moonlighting. Used to be known one, as I said earlier, one protein, one gene, one function. We now know these proteins have multiple functions. Proteins are doing things you wouldn't even anticipate. It's like a multifunctional tool. Now, these redundant um, elements, the cell uses them to slow and speed the process. Like I said, this DNA code is very, very highly compressed. Now, based on the evidence uh, he talked about, um, obviously with, with junk DNA and, and how we don't have a, a valid interpretation of, of the data, they'll say that, that ENCODE had a um, definition of functional that is too broad because ENCODE defined function as specific biochemical act activity, uh, which is true. This just means that, you know, they don't know the function of a given sequence of, of, of this junk DNA, but that there is some activity associated with it, but it at least demonstrates that the DNA is, is not idle. And since junk DNA is non-coding DNA, I want to know why it's being transcribed in, into RNA because many evolutionists in RJ, I'm sure, would say that the RNA isn't doing anything, but that there's activity, but it's not useful activity. Many believe that it's also one of those evolutionary leftovers that hasn't been eliminated yet, but it can't be shown that this RNA is, is non-functional. And really the evolutionists like um, RJ here, just saying this to accommodate the evidence with, within their evolutionary worldview. Because for a biblical creationist, it would be inconsistent with a logical orderly designer that we attribute to God to design organisms with a lot of this non-functional DNA. So the finding that this junk DNA has activity, that it's not idle and may be functional is, is, is certainly consistent with, with the hypotheses of, of created heterozygosity. Um, it's also consistent within a, a, a biblical worldview. Now, he also talked about um, nested hierarchies um, and how cars don't um, reproduce. But at the end of the day, that's just a common uh, misunderstanding about uh, what we're saying about nested hierarchies, because obviously given our model, it doesn't take much reflection to see that our model makes this strong prediction because God designed the entire universe, including the various kinds of biological life that exist in it. That means we would expect to find that life fits a design pattern. Since humans are made in God's image, we can get a sense for what kinds of design patterns God might have used by examining the patterns that result from human design. So when they say, oh, cars don't reproduce. It's a misunderstanding. So these nested hierarchies, they, they, they abound among the, the design things in our world. And we actually see uh, transitional forms. We see, you know, the Dodge Journey. We see the, the, the um, Ford Flex. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right. So thank you very much for that rebuttal from Standing for Truth. We are now going to transition over to the rebuttal from RJ. So resetting the clock. And the floor is yours, RJ. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting about the genetic. I'll just point out that uh, uh, virtually everything in the cell, when the cell replicates, it basically transcribes everything. And then whatever doesn't get used gets recycled. And it, it's a very rapid process. Uh, and so this is not something that either favors or uh, um, objects to either evolution. It's just a biological process. Um, I, I'm glad he brought up, oh, I, I did want to get into a, a, a question that I hope that Standing can deal with. Does he ever fact check anything that he reads? He's good at repeating the arguments that I've seen in the anti-evolution literature. But the question is, does he source check it to find out whether or not that's actually true? I'm glad he brought up catastrophic plate tectonics because boy, that's something that doesn't work. It's preposterously wrong. And bringing up the Indian plate is a particularly delicious example because we can trace the, the plate movement. We can measure the plate movement for one thing. You can physically measure the amounts that things are uplifting. We can measure the distance at which the plate is moving. And um, there's nothing in this that is inconsistent with the actual dynamics of uh, geological processes. We know that uh, 70 million years ago, India wasn't where it is now. It was down by the Seychelles. We know that because the Deccan Traps, half of it's down in the middle of the Indian Ocean, very specific geological data on what kind of rocks the volcanic deposits are like fingerprints. And before that, um, 90 million years ago, it was down by New Zealand. There was another hot spot. In fact, originally, uh, India was way down uh, nested in the Southern Hemisphere uh, in the supercontinent that had formed in there. And it got 
pushed out in a similar kind of plate movement that we can see that's moving uh, the San Andreas Fault northwards and squeezing like a banana out of a peel. Uh, and that's what happened with uh, India. India ricocheted off of this hot spot that's in uh, New Zealand. We can tell that because of the volcanic deposits on the eastern end of India, which match up with that group. No creationist, absolutely nobody, Andrew Snelling or anybody else, has given any physical dynamics as to how any plate movement could possibly be moving in the way that it does at the speed that it would need to do to have this taking place in a mere centuries or so after uh, the flood. It's all absolutely hypothetical. I read their stuff. I see how vague they are. They can't work out the maps of things. If you compare an actual technical literature on the plate boundaries that are worked out in paleo, it is absolutely meticulously detailed and nothing whatsoever at that level is occurring on the creationism side. And I'd be fascinated to see him deal with that. Uh, plate tectonics, they had to deal with it in part because of the fact that when they, the, the creationists of the 1960s and 70s uh, were thinking in terms of um, uh, the earth as it is now. And they realized pretty soon that none of their models, none of the, the flood model, no a bit of, of ice canopies or vapor canopies could fit with the existing uh, geography. So they had to start lowering the mountain ranges. They had to start rearranging the landscape. They've arbitrarily been glomming onto the supercontinent material. It's happenstance, it's ad hoc, and it's geologically preposterous. And that's another reason why uh, that the creation science community has never been able to account for anything. And yet another indication, nobody ever tries to use flood geology to find oil deposits. Not a dime's worth of that. The real geologists will only make money by following standard geology and making and finding where the oil actually is based upon standard uh, uh, cosmological systems. So that's a physical measure. Exxon and all the rest do not use flood geology for the obvious reason that it doesn't work. So I'm about a minute shy. I will be uh, happy to relinquish that for our Q&A later. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, RJ. So we have finished our first round of rebuttals. We are now going to move into the second round of rebuttals. And thank you for tuning in. As mentioned, if you got questions, shoot them in the comments section. If you're enjoying this debate, hit that subscribe button as we will have many more in the future hopefully with these same gentlemen coming back for more debates as it's always been a pleasure and it's been respectful so far and i'm sure it will continue to be so we're kicking it over for the round two of rebuttals standing for truth the floor is yours and i'm resetting the clock well thank you um, i guess uh, there's a few things here to say i'll start with cpt since that's the last thing that he talked about. At the end of the day, the flood does explain the fossil record. I mean, what we really see in the vast, vast majority of the fossils from top to bottom is marine fossils. 98% of the fossils we see of marine fossil, fossils, they're mixed with land fossils. We find clams mixed with birds, mixed with horses in all different strata. So the vast majority of fossils in the record are marine. Now, animals running from the floodwaters, we find animal tracks before we find the actual animals, which is certainly tough to, for the evolutionists to explain. We see vegetation being destroyed, animals being destroyed, that the floodwaters come in, they recede slowly, gradually, burying organisms in their habitats, slowly building and progressing its way up. Mostly in the upper layers, we see you know, post-flood diversification and dispersion, which is readily explainable through land bridges, floating mats, say during the ice age, birds distributing plants and other materials. Animals can be distributed around in very natural means during cataclysmic events. All the phenomena we see certainly fits the uh, global flood model. Uh, the meters of, of seconds movement of, the, of CPT were due to underground materials pushing the pre-flood ocean crust towards the continents and dragging them down. That actually makes a testable falsifiable uh, prediction that uh, we discovered with, with NASA. Um, I'll, I'll provide a link for that. Uh, you know, evolutionists like RJ, they struggle a lot explaining why these marine fossils are found on the continents, right? They have to avoid, as you can see, a global flood explanation because of their incredible bias. So they say the sea level has risen and, and fallen set seven times to bring fossils up to the continents. It's, it's hard enough for sea level to rise and fall once. It has to do with seven times. Those who study geology know that the lighter, less dense continents float on the denser mantle beneath them. 
This alone debunks the rising and falling seven times of, of sea levels. Evolution can't explain the geologic record, but with our model, we can. And as you can see, he, he ignores uh, genetic entropy, he ignores obviously what we know about genetics. Um, he, he also talks about, actually, um, as I was finishing about the uh, nested hierarchies, we also know, because he'll, he'll go to the you know, reptile mammal transitions, transitional um, fossils found in the records. But we know based on our model too, that some products of human design actually seem to span two categories. It's obvious fall in entirely different classes, yet vehicles exist that blend the features of these two very different means of transportation. For example, amphibious assault vehicles resist classification. They are the perfect example of a design transitional form, designed for the transitional environment between water and land. There are many hard to classify vehicles, as, as I've said, with the invention of crossover vehicles, for example, the distinction between cars and SUVs is becoming blurred. What is currently labeled a car and what is labeled an SUV is now a matter of debate. So at the end of the day, there's a competing explanation for that. Like I said, bones in the dirt, they're not inherited, traits are. Uh, back to the, the um, to uh, obviously genetic entropy here. If, if you look at what the bottom line is and in why evolution, Ponscon to people evolution can't be true and therefore you know his interpretation of the fossils can't be true is that selection, it removes only the worst deleterious mutations and amplifies only the best beneficial mutations. I still haven't seen him provide me a mechanism that adds this new novel uh, meaningful information to the genome and can I'm combat really this accumulation of deleterious mutation. This means that the accumulating damage is largely invisible, like rust on a car. I don't know why he doesn't like that analogy, but it, it certainly fits perfectly, especially if you understand the model that um, you know population geneticists certainly acknowledge is a problem, but these adaptations tend to be highly visible, say antibiotic resistance. But that means if RJ here were to present us, I haven't even seen one, but let's say he were to present us with even a thousand examples of adaptation, say, um, through beneficial uh, point mutation, duplications, whatever it is, he's still failing to address the key issue, which is net gain versus net loss. Because no one disagrees with adaptation. This fits our model perfectly. It explains fine tuning to an environment, but it's not gonna explain the astounding internal left. workings of life. It really doesn't even begin to explain the mystery of the genome. Another thing he brought up earlier, how much time do I have? 40 seconds now. Another thing he brought up too is, was um, ERVs, uh, endogenous retroviruses. Uh, at the end of the day, if, if ERVs are found to have function, then it is highly unlikely that they were inserted by retroviruses. And functional ERVs would depend heavily on their position and their sequence. If they were positional and positioned slightly wrong, or they had the wrong sequence, they wouldn't be functional. The evidence is certainly on our side when it comes to uh, this highly compressed, uh, you know, G genome uh, of ours, but that means no ERV, no, none of these endogenous yeah, retroviruses yeah, should have function. But there's increasing evidence that ERVs do have. How, how much time do I have? Two seconds. None. Awesome. No. Okay. So thank you very much for that. Now we are going to go to RJ's second rebuttal, and the clock is reset. So RJ, when you're ready. I am ready, yeah. I noticed that he did not an, uh, discuss the point I raised about whether he fact checks his material. And so merely repeating the same claim about uh, genetic entropy doesn't make it any more buttressed. Um, if you rely upon a secondary source, one of the things that I have discovered in my research, and it's been going on a long time. I, I asked uh, when uh, he was born, and apparently he was born in 1989. I have literally been researching the creation evolution issue at source level longer than he has been alive. So I know um, a, a large range of the technical literature, and I know what has been discussed and what isn't. And if you are a parasitical cider who simply regurgitates the argument being developed by somebody else and never bothering to fact check to see whether it's actually true by reading a the sources that are specifically cited by the people in question to determine do they say what the source claims they do and more importantly are they leaving out information uh the material about the fossil record and the geological system this was not developed by evolutionists that Sedgwick was just as much of a creationist believer in God as any of the people at Answers in Genesis, but he knew his geology. And he never became an idea that the geological system was worked out by evolutionists and that it was uh, completely independent of uh, the, um, the uh, that it was just merely the, the reflection of an evolutionary assumption is just plain twaddle. 
Uh, and the idea that the sorting mechanisms, the claims about uh, uh, levels of things, this is a generic argument that's being made by creationists for the last 40 years. If you look at the specific geological deposits and the details of what is found there, you will discover that the facts are not what they are being presented. That if you look at the exact details of particular deposits and what animals and plant material are found there, you can recreate with very great fidelity the actual paleoclimate that existed at that particular time. All of this is not happening in a gigantic mush of a flood. And no flood geologist, not Andrew Snelling, not John Woodmorat, not Ord, uh, none of them are able to look at these material in relationship to the technical literature. Or they're relying on really old stuff. Andrew Snelling would bring up material from the 19th century, 1850s material on technical points where if you discovered what the recent material was, you discovered that this mysterious deposit turned out to be a tidal formation and that this was known to be so. So the only way that you're gonna find out whether or not the secondary material that you're relying on is reliable is if you try to find out what the full facts are. And I will simply tell you that the measurement that I have at source level involving tens of thousands of technical papers that the anti-evolution movement, including the young earth creationists, are missing 90% of the data field. And if all you do is repeat that you're getting, you're never going to be able to get past that. Um, all of the genetic material, um, if you read the actual genetic work, uh, this is not supporting the creation model. The only way you can arrive at a creation model is if you start pairing off the data. I also read the baromenologists. Um, they too lop off the data field. They're trying to figure out how many created kinds there were. When I read their papers and discover how manipulative and how data suppression they are. Only one study has been done by a baromenologist on the reptile mammal transition and he picked a minor family and he removed 30% of the data field right off the bat in order to keep it from connecting up to a previous family. When I see that at the source data level um, and find that it's a consistent pattern across all of anti-evolutionism, I cannot see why there's a debate here. Well, when you understand that the people who are defending creationism don't check their sources and never bother to think through what their model is and keep on repeating the same material over and over again, well, of course they have that. And I'm ahead of the game here, so I relinquish the show again. Thank you very much, RJ. And RJ is giving up roughly 45 seconds, so we will add that to the Q&A as well. And we are now going to switch over to the next rebuttal, and that is actually going to be our final rebuttal. So this is Standing for Truth, starting the third rebuttal, and following that, we will have our closing and Q&A. So Standing for Truth, we are kicking it over to you for your last rebuttal. Well, thank you. Um Certainly, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, a, a very strong case is, is being made for the biblical model and a very strong refutation of the evolutionary model is being made. He's not even addressing the issues of genomic degeneration. He doesn't understand the model. He doesn't understand that all population geneticists certainly agree that we are degenerating. At least they have rescue devices that he's not even presenting. Here's why there's a problem. Uh, the bottom line with, with genetic entropy is, is that, you know, virtually every one of us is exceedingly mutant. This destructive mutation process has been going on for a long time. In addition to the roughly 100 new mutations we've each added to the human gene pool, we have inherited a multitude of mutations from our ancestors. The deleterious, the, this accumulation cannot, cannot be combated by natural selection or any amount of beneficial mutations. The fact that all people are mutant makes selection much more difficult. If we were to select against all mutations, no one could reproduce, resulting in instant extinction. This is the issue here. Obviously, this selection strategy creates a reproductive cost, and I don't think RJ realizes this reproductive cost of selecting for these deleterious mutations because it's too high. It's widely acknowledged that we each inherit many thousands of deleterious mutations from previous generations. Collectively, as a population, as I've demonstrated earlier and hasn't been addressed yet, we carry many trillions of deleterious mutations. To make the problem easier, let's limit our attention to just the 600 billion new mutations that entered the human gene pool within our own generation. 
To calculate that, so it was just 100 new mutation times well over 6 billion people. Since we cannot simply select against mutants, we will have to select between individuals who are more mutant versus those who are less mutant. And as we can see, Recognizing more mutant versus less mutant is a huge problem in itself. Due to the cost of selection, we must select away much less than 33% of the population per generation, or we will quickly go extinct. There is no way to stop this genomic degeneration. That's why the bones found in the dirt that he talks about briefly can't be used as evidence. It's circular. When you find bones in the dirt in a court of law, and this is true, it may have been repeated, no fossils can count of evolution, especially in light of what we know about genetics. This is fact, and the atheists hate that fact. Once again, traits are inherited, not bones found in the dirt. He hasn't explained why the pre-existing heterozygosity, the pre-existing DNA differences model is not plausible in explaining the speciation and, and the biodiversity that we see because we both know that it is a plausible mechanism. And once again, the atheists ha hate that as well. All the fossils they find, they're dead. Arranging things in order the way you would like it to happen is ridiculous. It's nonsense, non-science. I can arrange a bicycle and then a tricycle and a four-wheeler. Wow. Two wheels, three wheels, and four wheels. That's proof of something, I guess. But it's a science fiction-based religion. And this is proof here. I can put a two-wheeled bicycle and a four-wheeler and predict, hmm, there must be a three-wheeler somewhere out there. And wow, lo and behold, there's a three-wheeled bicycle. In light of what we know about genetics, they can arrange things in order all they want. But with no mechanism to build the genome, there's no way to stop this entropic degeneration of our genome. It's just a circular reasoning based on a false assumption. Let me use a, a hypothetical case, for example. So Suppose the finches become, become extinct and future paleontologists come across an, 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 um, the, this island with, with fossil finches of various beak sizes. Suppose, furthermore, that this paleontologist has a pet theory that early finches had short, stout beaks and gradually evolved to birds with long, thin beaks. He could collect fossils that show the early beaks and some with the later beaks as well as fossils in between. Now, a minute and With 10 seconds left. The same logic is dark. How long? A minute and 10 seconds. With the same logic as Darwinists have used on the fish to amphibian or reptile to mammal or dino to bird, whatever, he can make a case for his pet theory. Of course, he would be wrong in concluding that the long, thin beaks evolved gradually from the short, stout beaks, just as his conclusion about finch evolution would be incorrect. So present-day speculation about these transitions and progressions are nothing more than just-so stories with no empirical data to back them up. Because without a mechanism to build the genome, without a way to stop this genomic degeneration, it's just a just-so story. And most people in the field of population genetics, um, genetics are aware that there is a growing genetic load due to the accumulation of deleterious mutations. So he needs to address that. To answer his question, yes, I've actually provided uh, James here sources and citations, plenty of them that he's going to put in the description box, backing up. Um, everything that I've said. So you can certainly go fact check that yourself uh, to see what, what I'm saying is true. I'd like to see an explanation for genetic I entry. I'd like to see where in genetics prove. Go ahead. And we I are think now. He said 10 seconds. Oh, yeah. So you had, he had ended with a few seconds left. And we are now switching to the closings followed by the QA. So now is actually a great time if you want to shoot your questions into that comments box. I will be searching for those, and if you give me an at modern day hysteria, that makes it a little bit easier for me to catch them. So thanks, I saw Athena Goddess of Wisdom just shot one in, and I will be looking for others. If you also let me know which debater it's for, that'll also make it go a little bit quicker. So with that, for your closing, before the Q&A, standing for truth, the floor is yours. Whoa, 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 don't I get a rebuttal to that? Oh, hold on, sorry about that. You're right, the rebuttal, the rebuttal from RJ. I'm really sorry about that, RJ. Yeah. Okay. So this is the rebuttal from RJ, final rebuttal before the closing. So RJ, the floor is yours. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, it's not merely whether Standing puts up sources that he's copied from his uh, secondary sources or not. It's what I'm talking about with the source uh, checking is does he determine whether they say what the creationist claims they say? That's what source checking is about. Um, on the uh, fossil matter, the idea that the fossils don't tell you anything, that's twaddle. If you have a particular bone structure, we know from the way organisms are put together, you can retro-engineer what genes are involved in those. And in the case of birds and mammals, since we have both of those extant, we can find out that you 
tweak a particular thing and recreate the uh, archosaur uh, beak that formed the, the bird beak uh, millions of years ago. This is not a matter of hypothesis. This is experimentation. The frame shift that occurs in the bird uh, uh, digits has been experimentally recreated. We're in the paleogenomics era. None of that work is done by creationists. It's completely off of their scope. They don't pay attention to that, but the field is moving on. So the idea that individual bones and individual structures that a fossil has is dictated by the biology and that the real science works out what that is and are able to retro-engineer and recalculate what uh, uh, mutations were involved in producing them, that's a field that's going on more and more and more. It started with just at the structural gene level, and then it started to work more into the cis regulatory level. It's only a matter of time before they operate at the homeobox gene level. Uh, the, the fascinating issue about whether or not they can retro engineer why the Ediacara biota are what they are. Did they have homeobox genes or not? Are they uh, all of them? Are, are they uh, uh, some new form of life, uh, phylum, or are they uh, actual animals? That's an area that given the pace at which the work is being done is probably going to be worked out within my lifetime and absolutely with uh, Standing's lifetime. But I guarantee you that with his kind of mindset, it's going to be off the scope or retrofitted in like the way they do plate tectonics. Um, the, the main issue is we can tell by the, uh, the fact of the matter about the proof is in the pudding. We can see who does the work and it's not the creationists. Creationists do technical papers. I probably read more creationist literature than Standing does, but I do something that I don't think he does at all, which is read the primary sources and find out what is and not being cited and read beyond that little box. Merely repeating the tropes about genetic entropy and this alleged genetic load, we've got paleogenomics. We can tell what the genomes of archaic humans are to find out whether or not this deterioration has taken place. It doesn't exist. We can tell this from other organisms where we can actually find the DNA of things from previous times and the, the consequences of it. And if, if you're just relying on the material that you're being fed at Answers in Genesis at the Institute for Creation Research and never looking beyond it, woof, you don't. I, I'm, uh, we will be looking at all the sources that you put up and I'll be tracking on that. I'll probably do some evolution hours on it. So bring it on, kid, bring it on. I think that's uh, another a minute and a half to go, but let's go for Q and A. All right, so we have RJ wrapping up early, and that's roughly two minutes that will go on to the uh, Q&A. So thank you for that, and now for the closing. Thanks for your patience on that, everybody. <laughs> Didn't mean to, just a quick skim by RJ on that. So we will go for a closing from Standing for Truth, and then we will have, of course, a closing for RJ. And standing for truth i have got the timer reset so when you are ready thank you okay uh just to address a few other things that he said i think uh he talked about snelling using old sources he uses the 1859 data from i think his name is antonio snyder which evolutionists also use today the concept of continental sprint evolutionists hijacked the idea and changed it to continental drift so um, at the end of the day they have a huge bias just like he says apparently we have a huge bias uh, we know there's an evolutionary science, uh, scientist named Paul Davies. He said, science takes as its starting point that life wasn't made by a god or supernatural being. It happened unaided and spontaneously as a natural process. Anything against their their pet theory is, is certainly going to be discarded. He talked about um, ancient humans and evidence against um, apparently genetic entropy. I would certainly recommend reading the book Contested Bones. Uh, we're seeing evidence showing that early human population referred to as what we know as the Neanderthal was highly inbred and had a very high genetic load. Uh, at the end of the day, genetic entropy, it, it can't be stopped. I didn't see any uh, argument against it. Uh, at the, if we look at uh, genetics as well, because like I said, bones found in the dirt are not inherited. Traits are amazingly genetics match predictions of the flood model. If we're going back to the flood model, as he was talking about, at a genetic level, we know mitochondrial DNA is inherited exclusively from mothers. There were three young women on the ark who would have repopulated the earth after the flood 4,500 years ago. And what do we know? There are three major types of human mitochondrial DNA in the world. Also consistent is the Babel dispersion, where one would expect sudden formation of several variants in human mitochondrial uh, DNA due to rapid separation and isolation of various groups of people. And this is exactly what is observed. Now, since Babel, there have been you know, many 
generations accounting for the relatively larger distances, say between the dozens of these variants that we see and the three major haplogroups from which they emerged, which is all consistent within a um, biblical model. So that's why I say, if you look at genetics, that's what we can see empirically. That's what we can see um, certainly fits um, it's the uh, empirical evidence. Uh, when we look at the um, created heterozygosity uh, hypotheses, I still didn't see any argument against that. Um, he, it seems like he always has a, a problem with, you know, this apparent rapid speciation. Uh, but if, if you look at these heterozygous organisms, uh, most of their traits, they seem to have been present in coded genetically heterozygous form in their ancestors. So it's pretty simple. If, if the descendants of these ancestors shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity would have been easy. These shifts would have revealed traits that were previously hidden. We can look at Mendel and his pea plant uh, experiments to see this, which with uh, Darwin actually knew nothing about. Um, but for example, the genes controlling, say, zebra stripes likely come in dominant and recessive forms. As offspring arose with homologous forms of, say, one or the other, distinct traits would have appeared, striped and unstriped individuals. Population subdivision, say, through migration, would have isolated these distinct traits and promoted the rise of new species, say, such as zebras and asses. Now, these scientific pieces suggest that the pieces are all coming together quite well for a biblical-based model, actually. Now, if it comes to genetic entropy limits, I think we see limits, you know, physically and, 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 and genetically. You know, can you get a dog as, as big as an elephant? We know there's animals as big as an elephant, like an elephant, or as small as a flea. It, 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 we see limits. We see genomic degeneration. He still hasn't provided me an observable mechanism that adds the new necessary information. And I think all the fossils, as, as I've demonstrated here, can certainly be explained through a global flood. CPT is certainly a strong model. Uh, at the end of the day, I didn't see much. Yeah, I, I didn't see much of a model being presented by him. I, I think I've covered things in great detail. So I'll certainly uh, end my time here. Um, and thanks for the closing statement. For sure. Thank you very much. So now we are adding one extra minute as well to the Q&A, and we are now going to transition over to RJ's conclusion. So we are getting you, RJ, and I'm resetting the clock. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just make a, a brief reference. Uh, although mitochondrial DNA in vertebrates is usually conveyed by the female, there are actual occasional male uh, inheritance, which has been an interesting little minor blip uh, on the field. Um, what we again here see is the perfect archetype of the creationist mindset. He wants a battle between the biblical worldview and the evolutionist worldview, which he presumes to be atheistic. Uh, sorry, there are just as many religious uh, people working in various faiths uh, who are uh, operating in the evolution field because it's the data that matters. And I would contend I'm really looking forward to see the sources that um, uh, Standing is putting up in the documentation area. And I'll be checking it against my data field to find out how much of it are things that I've already got cataloged as stuff that is brought up by the anti-evolution literature and find out where he might have been getting his stuff from. And to see we're voting for much of anything. Um, as for uh, contested bones, uh, for the last several months, I've been going through contested bones because um, uh, one of my viewers had wanted uh, me to do an analysis on it and sent me the book. And I've been uh, going through it source by source by source. Uh, it's very sparsely documented at less than two sources per page, which is really low. Uh, it's uh, relying on a, a dogmatic position uh, roughly 40% of its sources as so far are used for authority quotes, not data. And of the um, technical literature that's cited, uh, nearly half of them are misrepresenting the primary source data field. He's constantly, Rupi and Sanford are constantly suppressing contrary information in their own cited sources. I don't have to guess at this. I am observing it directly. Um, standing will probably never change his mind. He will always be pushing the material that he sees in the creationist literature. What he will never be doing is what real scholars do, which is trying to find out what the whole data field is and to test things against all of that as carefully as possible. No creationist has been able to work out what the original supposed created kind DNA is because there, there can't have been any. They're never going to be able to use their models. A cladistic analysis has been extremely powerful as a tool. Theoretically, it could be used by creationists because it's not based on evolutionary assumptions. And you can tell the difference between 
designed objects that do not form nested hierarchies. They show rampant uh, changing in characters, not in a way that we see in the actual biology of living systems and how convergence all builds upon very specific kinds of genetic things, which there is a huge technical literature. I know by direct inspection, anti-evolutionists are ignoring. They're never getting onto the data floor. So um, there is indeed um, a conflict of uh, worldviews here, but it's not Bible versus evolution or religion versus atheism. It is sound method versus unsound method. And the fact of the matter is that any methodology that tries to impose a dogmatic worldview and barely bumps into the data field and is grounded upon rotten timbers at the base cannot be taken seriously. And that's why it's not being taken seriously in the regular scientific community. It operates in a little niche market that they write their papers in their own in-house journals with their own air quotes peer review to repeat the arguments and then followers like uh, Standing repeat these claims. They present them as if they're true uh, and they firmly believe that he's true. I'm absolutely convinced he believes every single thing he just said. The fact of the matter is though that the facts are not what he wants them to be. And I invite everybody watching this, do not take my word for it. Do not take his word for it. Track down the source material, read widely, read beyond the little teeny box of just one side or another and you will hear the ring of truth, but it's not coming from the creationist side. And there we've got another minute to spare. Let's go to Q&A. You betcha, so thank you very much for that, RJ. Now what we are going to do is, as RJ said, switch to the q and I have a surplus of questions for Standing for Truth. I don't have any for RJ yet. So if you're willing to throw any sort of question, ask him his favorite food, any sorts of questions for RJ, we will push those to the front of the line. But if you can, not really his favorite food, more questions related to the debate would be ideal. So we are going to start with this first question. And so uh, we do have a couple of questions from Athena, goddess of wisdom and warfare. The first is that they ho are hoping you're welcome to, or wanting to come to a, a live stream. And the second is that they're wanting to know uh, Basically, I'm putting this in the, the wording of a question for Athena, Goddess of Wisdom and Warfare. Are you aware that we can inherit mitochondria by the father as well? And I'm not sure if they mean by we, they mean mammals or humans, but um, at least humans, I'm, I'm guessing when they say we, it's got to at minimal mean humans. So uh, is that something they're asking if, you're, if you've read about? Um, so he's asking for an after stream. We'll have to see. I mean, I've got we got ten minutes of questions here till ten thirty-five. Um, from what I understand, mitochondrial DNA is inherited exclusively from mothers. Um, when we use that to point to the, um, you know, Noah's daughters-in-law, uh, which is certainly consistent with genetics. In regards to our model of pre-existing heterozygosity, we would say that the mutations in, in, in the mitochondrial DNA line are, are exclusively through mutations. And um, in nuclear DNA would certainly be uh, pre-existing DNA differences. The tens of millions of DNA differences you see, we would say are front-loaded functional differences. That's why certainly the results from ENCODE are important. Um, and a functional DNA code is important as well. In regards to obviously genetic entropy, we would expect some junk DNA, um, but certainly not as much as evolutionists would expect. But I mean, that's all I have in regards to mitochondrial DNA. And I'll let Athena know if I can join the um, after stream afterwards. We'll see at, at 1035 how, how this goes and go from there. You got it. So next, uh, and I always figured, so I've done these debates before, and I always figured if I got more questions, I was happy, and the reason is because I got to talk more. So my hope is that standing for truth, you, uh, not just for the sake of talking more, but because what I really mean by that is you get to kind of put your case forward. So uh, there is evidence in psychology that when you're able to defend your position well against objections after a presentation, it's more persuasive than if you had just given the presentation by itself. Uh, so, the next question, these are, like I said, standing for truth, they're, they're uh, firing them for you. So, Jackson Wheat asks, can standing explain why Jensen's Finch idea 
hasn't been applied to any other organisms. So other than finches, of course. So again, that's Jackson Wheat who asks, can standing explain why Jensen's, and I think this is maybe Nathaniel Jensen's, finch idea hasn't been applied to any other organisms? Okay, so uh, what I would say is, well, obviously we've seen it in, in the finches here that, um, you know, there was an, a, a shift from heterozygosity to homozygosity leading to speciation in, in a very short amount of time. We've only started documenting um, speciation events, but if you understand our model of pre-existing heterozygosity, pre-existing uh, front-loaded DNA differences, uh, the speciation events would have been a lot more quick, a lot more rapid at first. Um, certainly, there um, obviously would have been a, um, a, a flood bottleneck after the um, obviously after the flood, but so little of that DNA variety would have been lost that there still would have been a uh, good reason for those uh, speciation events, but it actually would have been a lot more rapid after that due to the after effects of the flood, whether it's the radiation, environmental pressures, selection pressures, an ice age that we believe followed. So certainly it would have slowed down now. So the, the speciation rate um, like I said, has slowed down hundreds of years since. Um, and when we actually look at the allelic diversity, uh, if you were following my presentation, we were saying that allelic diversity doesn't arise, say, just through mutation, right? And, and we're using the genomic position definition of an allele rather than the gene unit definition. So that means other mechanisms besides mutation will and can generate allelic diversity. Uh, for example, I'm almost done here. A single gene typically spans thousands of nucleotides and single nucleotide variants might actually be distributed throughout the gene. For example, at 90 of the nucleotide uh, sites within a gene, right? So if we actually allow for this genomic position definition of alleles, um, every single one of these 90 single nucleotide variants may have existed in a heterozygous state in each of the individuals of the pairs brought on board the arc. So speciation is not a problem uh, to answer this question in a nutshell. Uh, speciation rates and events are slowing down based on our model, um, but certainly the more we document and the more we study and research, I'm sure that we will find more cases much like the Finch case. Hmm. Can I just put in a, 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 a tiny comment on that? Yeah, that, I'd like you to comment on, on that as well since you're not really getting any questions. Go ahead. Yeah, um, well actually one, did, uh, one question did come up. Uh, the we here is not you or even me. The we that you're referring to are um, either the creationists who are not the ones doing the work either, they're largely relying upon the work by the general geneticists. And the point at issue is, and I hope everybody listening to this does their own fact checking on this, that the we who are the creationists are leaving out most of the data field. And unless you fact check that aspect, you're not going to realize how you're being sold a bill of goods by people who are quite convinced that what they're saying is true. Would you say it sounds convincing if, if you weren't in an evolutionary biased position? Just out of curiosity, I'm genuinely curious. No, because, because he's leaving out more of the data field. That um, the uh, There's been a huge amount of material. By the way, the, the creationists in their current Leitner's paper on birds functionally accepts that all 1,200 species of finch have originated from a hypothetical early finch kind. Now, if this argument about genes is accurate, you should be able to theoretically retro-engineer what the genomes would be of those, and then you would have to check to see whether they're matching up with their putative cousins uh, over in some other kind. But we know that Leitner left out all the fossil data, and in terms of uh, Jensen and the like, they're leaving out most of the genetic data. They're, they're cherry-picking their source data. So would you say a lot of uh, your arguments and rebuttals and objections during this debate and obviously during this Q&A um, are more so source attacking? Like, obviously, I know you're saying that they've left out a lot of sources, a lot of key facts, um, but based on the evidence and based on from what I'm hearing, it's mostly um, source attacking. Am I accurate yeah, to say that? If you, the object of all rigorous analysis is to account for the data field. And if you're leaving out most of the data, you're not making an argument, you're making an apologetic. And the people who pay attention to all the data field aren't on the creationist side. They're cherry picking in a way that you do not see in the regular evolutionary literature, regular scientific literature. Well, I guess it comes down to, because I certainly think the biblical model 
um, from what I'm presenting here is is certainly um, convincing and it's empirical. I guess it's about the layman to go and source check, to look at the papers that I left for James to leave in the description box. Go look at those. Go look at Jen, uh, Dr. Jensen's technical papers. He's got all his citation sources. Go do your research. Find out if what I'm saying is true. Find out if what uh, RJ is saying is true and, and do your due diligence then. Because if you're just going to attack. I still would like to know a question of do you ever source fact check the material that you read in Jensen or any of the others? What do you think you are doing if you're source checking? So, for example, some of the sources and papers that I provided James are directly from. So, for example, I'll use one example um, in the answers in Genesis book. There's some chapters on, you know, are chimps and humans related where it goes into, you know, human chromosome two, ERVs, things like that. They got their sources and citations at the bottom. So what I'll do is highlight those, put that into the web page search bar and then browse over the um, over the paper. So that's my way of source checking. I hope that answers your question. And that's very superficial. Are you trying to find out whether or not the data blip is in the original material? but not reading beyond that? I'm not sure you're, so are you saying once I look at that citation and source that say, let's just say Dr. Jensen is presenting and I look at the data that they're using, am I also looking at whatever sources they're using just kind of like a, a big trail of sources? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, an internal content, for example, if a technical paper has a particular point about uh, a particular uh, a mutation at a particular spot, but they paper to explain the evolutionary origins of that, how it affects other organisms, how it, there have been technical work on experimental uh, work that has seen how it produced the mutations and the effects that it does. That's all relevant information. And if your secondary source is leaving that out, you have to wonder why they're leaving it out. And if that other information is not undermining their argument, why wouldn't they want to bring this up if they were presenting a fair case? So well, I would, we're going to have, we're gonna have uh, standing that they're for probably, truth. Get, yeah. We're going to have standing for truth answer, and then we're going to quick jump back to the Q&A. Sorry, I just want to get maybe one more yeah, Q&A yeah, yeah. uh, question. Yeah, we got a lot of questions in there for him at least. I think a couple have come <laughs> up for me, though. Yeah, maybe next one can be for RJ, one more for me, and then we'll end it here. But I would say that, you know, no evidence is probably going to be sufficient to create a change of mind in, in the evolutionist. So when I look at this, a lot of the sources and a lot of what the evolutionists are saying in their papers, I certainly see a, a strong commitment to naturalism as compared to a strong commitment to the evidence itself. Because really, there's no other alternative than ponds come to people evolution. So they're going to have to accept natural selection and in mutation as the as the source for building the genome you know at, at the end of the day when I um, look at the actual data uh, you know from a, a non naturalistic point of view I think it's pretty clear that natural selection and, and mutations are not going to build the genome and I can sit back and relax and think okay the primary axiom can't be true but if, if they want to hold to that primary axiom axiom regardless um, you know what what can I do or what else can I say Gotcha. So we will do, as I uh, mentioned, we'll do one for RJ. We have one that we're going to usher to the front of the line because we had a lot for standing. So this is actually a uh, shot to me through Twitter. And it's actually Wise Man Talks asks, uh, evolution has, so it has a question at the end, I promise. He says, evolution has a strong case on the development of life. However, in all theories that use evolution as its fundamental base, time is a major factor. So if the technology that recreates a biological organism would be developed apart from cloning, isn't that proof that life can be created? Oh, um, that's actually quite a fascinating question about it. Uh, is a would an artificial replication of the origin of life therefore settle the issue? I think some creationists will just move the goalposts and say, aha, this was done by the intervention of a designing mind, the scientist, and therefore it's not a resolution of it. Although I think it would be a serious problem. Um, that there are lots of issues that are, I, I didn't expect the research to get as far along in my lifetime as it has. Uh, remember, I date from a time when DNA was just being discovered. Homeobox genes were only discovered in the 1990s. And a lot of things that we only discovered literally in the last 15 years or so 
that the ribosome, uh, the core of it, turns out to be an RNA molecule rather than a protein. And the, uh, the elements that we see, lots of tantalizing clues about things. Um, I don't think anybody should base their theology on whether or not life originated naturally or not. Um, many Christian theistic evolutionists are perfectly happy with a naturalistic origin of life. It doesn't mean that there's no God. Uh, so it, it, these are in some respects disconnected areas. It would be relevant uh, to see other examples of life if we can ever find that's any on Europa or whether or not there's a, a, a previous life on Mars. I'm not holding my breath for anything being alive there now. These would be highly relevant, but it still doesn't resolve the fundamental issues of uh, whether or not there are transcendent entities and you can make arguments for that. So uh, origins are bust. nice if we can resolve that problem. But it doesn't make the reptile mammal transition go away. It doesn't make all the weird parts of Genesis go away uh, it, it, uh, or the Mahabharata or uh, Hindu, um, uh, other Hindu mythologies. Uh, it, other religions have the same problems too. So we'll be having debates like this 500 years from now, probably. There will be a different data set. They will have moved in other areas. There'll be different rationalizations. But these fundamental questions are in many respects unresolvable. So there's there's my uh, comment on that. Absolutely. <clears throat> so one thing we are going to do is before wrapping up, we've got just one quick question, and this is going to be for Standing for Truth. So I want to say thanks to Standing for Truth uh, for being willing to stay on extra long because as I mentioned I screwed up the time. I'm sorry uh, These time zones are hard for me <laughs> No problem. It was a lot of fun standing for truth is he's been staying on longer than originally planned It's late for him, but he's taken one more question So I want to say thanks to both debaters and this last question for standing for truth is <clears throat> God of spaghetti asks how does standing explain genetic drift and actively observable evolution. Oh, uh, you cut out there. Can you repeat, repeat that? And who's that from? You bet. That was for um, the, the God of Spaghetti asks, how does standing explain genetic drift and actively observable evolution? Okay, so he wants to know, okay, so genetic drift if you want to know what that means genetic drift the best way i could explain it would be um, the change say in the in the frequency it has to do with gene variants in a population that are um, changing due to random um with the alleles in the offspring uh being uh, isolated in in more populations but genetic drift is actually a problem for the evolutionists because if we actually look at genetic entropy, these neutral mutations, they're unselectable. They're invisible to natural selection. So they're only subject to this random drift. So this mutation accumulation problem based on genetic drift um, is actually no help to evolution. So sure, you're going to see some uh, speciation. You're going to see some changes. You know, Do those changes have, have limits? Obviously, biological evolution, I would say, means a change in allele frequency and populations in generations over time, but I guess it's my point that genetic drift is is on the side of, of creation and certainly um, against um, universal common ancestry. It's, it's not going to help with these accumulation of, of deleterious mutations. And if, if RJ wants to respond to that and, and give his piece as well, I, I don't have a problem with that. Oh, this would be... Within a minute, if you're able to respond, uh, Arjun. In a matter of seconds, just have you read any technical literature on that issue, or is this a topic that you hadn't investigated? With, in regards to genetic drift? Yeah. I've, I've read, I've read te technical, I'm not sure exactly which portion of uh, genetic drift and speciation in, in, in the evolutionary theory you're talking about in regards to it. But yeah, I, I, I've, read, I've read papers, I've, I've read technical papers on uh, the creation side. I, I don't think you, actually, I want to ask you, how, how many of the technical papers have you read? Like, have you read Dr. Jensen's most recent paper 
on the um, origin of eukaryotic and prokaryotic species where he goes into the mitochondrial DNA rates, the nuclear DNA rates, um, created heterozygosity. Because I noticed you said you do read um, creation. Yeah, I've got a, a little over 5,000 uh, young earth creationist sources in my tip field and another um, uh, 3,000 so odd uh, intelligent design material. And as I go through each technical literature, just like Nathaniel Jensen's thing that uh, uh, you brought up about the um, uh, finches, I made a point of looking all of that up. And that's kind of what I do. Uh, and so I'm looking to see whether the sources match up. You brought up contested bones. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm not taking anybody's word for it, but I am looking up the original material. And I don't have to guess at how superficial and manipulative Sanford and Ruby are, I can observe it at the source level. And I do recommend that you take up that practice as well, because if you want to make a solid argument, you need to offer way more of the data field than your side has offered so far. Well, I appreciate having a debate discussion with somebody who has informed themselves on, you know, creation literature, technical papers um, coming from the creation side. Contested Bones is certainly something that I'm just digging into. So I, I think it's great that you're also digging into it. I've talked to a lot of even fellow creationists who don't even know it exists. I think it's interesting. And maybe in a month or so when I've actually studied it thoroughly, we can have another uh, discussion where we can um, certainly focus on that um, and go into more detail on that. And if you decide to ever read Replacing Darwin, we can certainly get into um, some of the information and, and details on that as well. Thanks, RJ. Uh, you have to send me, anyone who wants to send me the book, since I don't have a lot of scratch for these things. You betcha. So we are very glad that you came tonight. All the people who have asked questions, I wish we could go through more of them. I'm sorry about that. I know that you guys have a lot of other good questions, and so I want to say thanks for sending them in. Thank you, especially, though, to the debaters for getting in the hot seat, being willing to engage on these issues, and, and your preparation as well. Thank you both very much. I think worth you. having is not worth me. defending. You betcha. Well, thank you for both of you. And as mentioned, everybody, their channel links are in the description below. Even if you don't agree with them, check them out. That way you can at least understand where they're coming from. And also, uh, again, we'll have future debates, including one this Saturday on whether or not religion is harmful or good for the world. So would love to have you come back. If you want a reminder, hit that subscribe button. And again, thanks for coming. Thanks for our debaters. And last, keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Have a good night.